Okay, we got a great show here today. It is a solo show, and it is an unusual one. Because, you know, we do a lot of time talking about games that are upcoming and games that just happened. Film review, previews, we do some more interviews, four-minute drills, yada yada, a lot of guests. Today is the rare day we are recording on a game day. It's Sunday night. The Patriots are about to kick off their preseason finale. Finale for the whole NFL preseason in two hours down in Washington against the Commanders. Jane Daniels is not going to play. So by the time you listen to this, that game is over. But as you'll note by the title today, this is not about that game. This is about a 53-man roster projection when the Patriots, like every other NFL team, makes their cuts by Tuesday at 4 p.m. And as someone who has uh, been at every single practice but two, who has charted all the reps, uh, noted the order of reps, the number of reps for players at basically every single position, I feel comfortable telling you right now that barring some miracle or, God forbid, horrendous injury on the other end, that the Patriots' current projection where they stand in these players isn't going to change a whole lot tonight. A lot of players are going to play. And pretty much the haze in the barn. So I have my roster projection. I will tell you right off the top before we get to every single mailbag question you guys delivered this week. And it's not just because someone asked about beer to mix up all the football talk. It is um, only got 52 players on it. I'm reserving one spot for a team that's picking third in the waiver order, has clear holes both in the short term and the long term. And it's supposedly going to be aggressive in using that place in the waiver order to pick up players that, as Elliot Wolf told us last week, the whole freaking scouting department is scouring preseason tape looking for help. Now, that's not unique to the Patriots, but that is the backdrop against this decision of saying, hey, I'm only going to pick 52. It's a rare year where it's a struggle to get to 53. And honestly, if you have been reading or listening or watching or whatever, other 53-man roster projections – You know there's a lot of overlap this year from folks in my seat and other places. So it's not to say that we're right. I just think there's a lot less mystery this year because of the talent deficit, we'll just call it, and the fact that everyone, coaches, front office, media members, pretty much see this roster the same way. So we're going to go position by position. I will spice this up a little bit. And by spice, I really mean probably like a pepper or salt. This is not anything that's going to get you off your chair. But when I list the players in a row – I will go by the order of strongest job security to the one closest to the bubble. Now, spoiler alert, when we get to safeties, Kyle Duggar and Jabril Peppers, I have to put them in some kind of order. They're both making the team. I don't even think they're going to play tonight. They're not going anywhere. I do and will put them in a particular order, as you'll see then. Uh, So just something to pay attention to as we go through this, because I know you're consuming a lot of this content and will up until Tuesday at 4 p.m., which is why we're doing this tonight. So... Uh, after this, I'm going to write a column. But for now, let's do the roster projection, get to the mailbag, and get out of here. So, one last reminder. This is not the roster I would pick if I was Elliot Wolf. This exercise is to say, what do I think the roster will look like by the time we get to 4.01 p.m. on Tuesday? What will the Patriots do, based on the information I have? But if I think they're going to do something I wouldn't, I'm not going to go with my pick. I'm going to go with what I think that they will do. Let's go. Quarterbacks right off the top. They're keeping three. This is how I see it. Drake May, Jacoby Brissett, and Joe Milton. Jacoby Brissett is going to start week one. And I say that not with my Boston Herald reporter on. I say it as the podcast host who's got a little bit more journalistic freedom here. But you don't see position competitions that Gerard Mayo has been talking and talking and talking about where one player gets all the starting reps and the other one doesn't. And especially this week where I said on TV, I think it was Wednesday, They tipped their hand today because they're doing regular season-style practices before tonight's game against the Commanders. And so you have the first-team offense, second-team offense. Starters get virtually all the reps. And then you have a couple, like emergency scraps. Hey, if he goes down, we'll give you a couple snaps with the center. Well, that's what Drake May got. So it's not just that Jacoby Brissett, who was better for the first three weeks and has been the worst passer since, is still getting the starting reps. It's that they're in regular season mode, and he's the guy at the top. So I think he's going to start week one. I think that will be announced Monday or Tuesday. Uh, But, of course, Drake May has more job security. As for Joe Milton, oh, actually, before we get to Milton, I don't think I delivered these last time. Season-long stats for training camp. This is how I had it from my charting. You've got differences uh, amongst the media because some of them will tab sacks for players who got close to the quarterback in these rushing uh, 11-on-11 periods, but they can't touch the quarterback. They've either got to go by they've got to stand up. There's just a, a gray area there, and that goes even for the coaches, too. There's disagreement. I know within the staff in years past, but someone's got to make a call. My call might be different from the next guy. All of which is to say, for training camp, here's Jacoby Brissett. He uh, attempted 17 more passes than Drake May in 7-on-7s and 11-on-11s. 
He completed 65.4% of those passes, six picks, 28 sacks. So 65.4%, six interceptions, 28 sacks. Drake May, 62.4% completion percentage, five interceptions, and 21 sacks. So you will know that while well, Brissett had 17 more attempts in the larger sample of 246 passes compared to 229, that's not that big of a difference. And yet, May had 25% fewer sacks and one fewer interception. It wasn't as accurate because he's a rookie, but those are pretty good numbers for a guy who, after the first two weeks, you're going, yeah, he doesn't look ready. And he didn't, but things changed and he played better. And you see that in those numbers there. Okay, I mentioned Joe Milton. Uh, speaking of improvement, he's shown enough to me where you continue to work with him as a project, which is what he is. It's not because he didn't have a ton of experience in college. He was in Michigan for multiple years. He was then in Tennessee for multiple years. It's that he is making an even bigger transition than Drake May. When you just strictly talk about the last offense he played, he ran, he operated it at Tennessee to this long West coast verbiage, 15, 16 word play calls. And so that's part of it. It's the footwork aspect of it. And also a guy who just, Honestly, struggled to change up the velocity on his throws. And a lot of things we talked about, I think, was it two weeks now after that preseason opener? Anyway, he's looked good enough. Bailey's happy he got cut last year. They were signed him to the practice squad. I think if he wants to come back, they would have him as a fourth quarterback in that situation. But for now, I think he'll be on the street come Tuesday. And those are our quarterbacks. Three quarterbacks on the roster. Moving to running backs. This is pretty cut and dry to me. Ramondre Stevenson, Antonio Gibson, Jamichael Hasty is my running back three. Kevin Harris. So, Jamichael Hasty is a pass catching back. He's the smallest dude out there. Also, got the best aesthetic. Dreads on a running back forever is a big win for me. I don't care what the rating is in Madden. Bump it up two or three if that dude has got flow flying out the back. Anyway, Hasty not only is a better pass catcher from Kevin Harris, who ranked in the top three in drops for training camp, by the way, uh, and Harris fell off over the last week or two in camp. Hasty is a core special teamer. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. And for the folks who were always frustrated with Bill Belichick about the emphasis he put on special teams with the roster building, first of all, I would say I, I especially agree with you at the end. Second of all, I would say you still need to count on players who are backups at other positions to fill those roles where whether it's kickoff or punt return or punt coverage or kick return, you know they're out there, right? That they're just a part of it. And then you're filling out the other five, six, sometimes maybe seven spots around them. Hasty is one of these guys. He's got a spot on all four of those units. He's looked better in camp. He's caught more passes from Drake May with that second team offense and Kevin Harris did. Those to me are the four running backs. And Harris is, he's on like the front end of the bubble. If they do cut him, I think it would be because they're confident they could re-sign him to the practice squad if it came to it. Let's go to the receivers. I have six, and I think this is right on the money. In order, again, for job security. Jalen Polk's not getting cut as a second round pick. Demario Douglas, not getting cut because he's their best receiver. So they're in the same tier. Then you go to KJ Osborne, who's making the team. Tyquan Thornton, right now, wide receiver four. Then Javon Baker, whose job security is really tied to his status as draft pick. It's nothing he's done the last three weeks. And then Jalen Rager, who is, I don't know if he's 50 or he's 51 or 52, but he's not 53. He makes the team. Uh, but let's go back to the top. Jalen Polk has been mixing in with the starters the last two weeks. That means replacing Tyquan Thornton or KJ Osborne. He's coming up. He's also played a little bit in the slot. Big thumbs up. In the slot, Demario Douglas. This dude finished training camp first in catches despite missing team periods for basically the first two weeks of camp. So he squeezed in a summer's worth of catches in two weeks during 11-on-11s and 7-on-7s. Seven Only had one more than Jalen Polk for what it's worth. Um... But those two are at the top firmly for me. And then Osborne and Thornton, who I said before, have been running with the starters. They're going to be here. And Alex Van Pellet had a lot of praise for Thornton on Thursday, not only just about his speed, but he is legitimately tracking the ball better than he ever has before. And then like him a little bit better now in contested catch situations um, than they have before. And this is the best he's looked. I'm not saying he's anything more than wide receiver four on this Jeff chart or anything else, but based on how they've been playing him, how little he's played in the preseason, and the fact he started every single period. There's no other player on this roster that you would say, well, yeah, he started every 11-on-11 11 11 period, but he stinks. He's going to get cut. No, no, no. Tyquan Thornton is not the exception to that. He's going to make the team. Uh, Baker, again, it's just it's not been good. We talked about it about running. I think there are some uh, reads that he's missing in there, just like Joe Milton, Drake May, more simplistic, up-tempo offense. 
And he's just, I think, a little bit behind, certainly relative to the quarterbacks, as far as adjusting to NFL life and adjusting to NFL competition. Rager, for me, uh, gets the edge here. I talked about special teams already. Here we go again. The return ability, he's starting off a lot of those. And Marcus Jones, I think, will be the man on punt return. But Rager now has got more speed, more athleticism, and impact than Kayshawn Booty, period, as a player, but especially on special teams. And that gives him the edge, not to mention when they start to rotate those starters. Again, on the outside, it's been Polk, it's been Osborne, it's been Thornton with the ones. The next receiver up most consistently in camp was Jalen Rager. So to me, he gets the edge over Booty. I know we have a lot of Kayshawn Booty fans out there and i don't blame him but i would just ask you this where does he consistently win aside from having hands where he can just as we saw in the flat the other day against uh against the eagles he's got great hands but physically doesn't profile like Jalen rager who's also impacting a second phase it's a close call but i just think there's a clear winner here for what we've seen so far in camp how the patriots have treated him uh and used them both not to mention booty also never really rep with the ones this summer so that's just is what it is uh, moving on to tight ends, we got three here, and this is a little tricky because of health. We know Hunter Henry has been out for a long while. Austin Hooper came back. Mitchell Wilcox also came back, but Wilcox is battling with Michael Petway and Jaheim Bell. Right now, I have Bell outside looking in, probably the 54th or 55th man on the roster, and you can see the movement skills like we did even in the preseason opener, and that's cool. Like this, this athletic dude, he's good after the catch. A lot of advanced metrics like them coming out as a prospect, but he was a seventh round pick to a bottom five team in the NFL. Guys like him who get cut, get re-signed to the practice squad or go elsewhere. I don't think there's any risk here for the Patriots of him getting claimed by what he's shown in the preseason, which of course now he's going to go off for 103 touchdowns <laughs> against Washington tonight. But there were other teams, if you follow the Giants' hard knocks, it looked like they had him also listed with a character concern. I think some of that is overblown. I'm not knocking the kid. But for everyone who has been standing, the seventh-round rookie tight end, I would just say he's a limited, narrow player who's never going to play in line. And he didn't dominate in any kind of way, aside from one practice when he had three touchdowns and seven-on-sevens running the same flat or slide route uh, when the top three tight ends were out. That would say this is the evidence. This is the proof. This is some sort of um, trend that he's building towards really earning a roster spot in the NFL. It just hasn't happened, and it's fine. Maybe he does it later. But this is who he was entering the team, seventh-round rookie, and this is who he is right now. It's how he's looked so far this summer. So Hunter Henry could make the opener, obviously making the team. Austin Hooper definitely making the team they want to play with two tight ends. Mitchell Wilcox, because of that preference to open in 12 personnel, which we saw a lot this summer, I think is going to make the team. And then Bell's case might lie, honestly, more with scheme than it does anything he showed. Uh, in addition to obviously being an athlete, but again, he even after that practice, I just mentioned, I think it was last week, three touchdowns, seven on seven period of the red zone. That was it. He had a couple of drops, a couple of no shows uh, this week. I just think that's where it is with the tight ends, but maybe that changes. That brings us to 16 players. This brings us to 20. Offensive tackle, Caden Wallace. Best job security of this bunch. Youngest player, uh, third round pick, guy who... Cost just about as much as Chikumo Corp or second on my list, but Aaron Lowe and Calvin Anderson. Four feels light for a group where, again, we still can't point to two guys and just go, they're going to start. And if you could, it would be one guy, and it's Vidarian Lowe, again, based on the number of reps he's gotten, when he's gotten them in that order. And the play of the preseason, I think, especially in the second game, not the first, was better than he was given credit for. But he's already been tagged with, like, if you have to complain about the Patriots' offensive line and you need to name one player, he's it. And that sucks. But, like, that's that's a hole that he dug himself. That's where he's at. I think he's slowly coming out of it. But here are the four players. Uh, you'll notice I did not mention Mike Onwenu, who has been at right tackle the last couple of days of practice. I think the Patriots still see this, at least the staff closest to this, still see him as a backup option and prefer it that way at right tackle. To me, at the very least, he adds depth there. I would move him out to tackle, put Layden Robinson at right guard, where he's looked great, David Andrews at center, City South left guard, and just figure it the hell out at left tackle between Caden Wallace and Okorafor. core um, If you were going to have a surprise cut here, it would be Calvin Anderson, which surprise is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that, in that sentence for a guy who played to the end of the second preseason game and stunk and gave up a sack. But he can play both sides. He has played both sides. He repped consistently with the second-team offense. You just need bodies at an important position where you're already seeking help 
If they don't get it on the waiver wire, I think he comes back. Interior line, Mike on one, David Andrews, Layden Robinson, City Sal, Nick Lever. So this brings us to 25 in offense, uh, nine offensive linemen, which I think they'll carry. This group, I will say, probably had the most improvement start to finish in camp relative to expectations, not like actual on-field performance and growth. That would take a little bit more thought. But just looking at the names at the start of camp, even if you were a City Sal optimist, I don't think you're looking at this and going, they might want have an above average interior, just flat out, period. Uh, because you didn't know with a fourth round rookie who was going back to an old position after playing right tackle and right guard. He's a left guard now. And they've rotated him a little bit, but he's been good in one on ones. He's been good in team. And with him, David Andrews and Michael Wanu, that's a really strong, powerful, don't F with us kind of interior, especially in the run game. Backups, Layden Robinson. He might not be a backup for long. Again, if they feel comfortable moving on Wendy to right tackle, Layden Robinson was a multi-year starter at Texas A&M, a right guard, fourth-round rookie. It's hopefully you know by now. Uh, and then there's Nick Lever, who spent a lot of time lately learning to play backup center, and he had a bad snap the first day of practice, first day of camp. Hasn't since. And there was a missed exchange with Drake May, but I think that one was on Drake. So for him, Nick Lever, it's your backup center. You got backup guards uh, with him and Layden Robinson, and then starters with... City South, David Andrews, Michael Wenner. The NFL regular season is almost here, but you don't have to waste your time watching more preseason outside of the Patriots. You can play prize picks all summer. America's number one daily fantasy sports app has over 5 million active viewers. And unlike other apps, you guys, you know this by now, you don't play against anyone. You just pick against the numbers. If you pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, you watch the winnings roll in. Even taking 10 bucks, going all the way to 1000 So sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play for just 5 bucks. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. And then when football does roll around, man, if you think Tyree Kill is going to go for over 90 yards in the season opener, Miami does pretty well in their season openers, uh, that's an easy win. If you think the Patriots defense is going to show up and hold down Joe Burrow in Cincinnati, take the under on Joe Burrow. It's that simple. It's that easy. You've heard me talk about this for the Red Sox. God willing, they'll be playing in October. You can do all kinds of sports, but get ready for football with prize picks. It's available in more than 30 states across the country. So download prize picks today and use the code CLNS for a different bonus. This first deposit matches up to 100 bucks. That's right. Just put in CLNS on prize picks for a deposit match up to $100. Prize picks run your game. All right, enough offensive line. Let's go to defense. Edge players. This is a mix of outside linebackers. And defensive linemen, let's go from, again, best job security to least. Keon White, no said. <laughs> Dietrich Wise, Anthony Jennings, Josh Uche, O'Shane Zimenez. If you've been listening, I hope you have. You heard him early in this podcast, I think after the first week. He's flashing a little bit. Him or William Bradley King, who did not make the list. We'll get to him in a second. Uh, he's going to make a play in the preseason. Everyone's going to jump on him. Lo and behold, it's O'Shane Zimenez, who not long thereafter – and the joint practice against the Eagles is rotating in with the starters. And it's not just because you've got uh, health questions there. He earned it. So he's there. As far as the top of this group, look, Keon White is going to play all over the defensive line, but he's going to man one edge of this defense, depending on the front. I mean, sometimes you'll see if they want to go four down. Dietrich Wise will probably play defensive end. Opposite him, it'll be Jennings. Still excellent versus the run uh, as an early down starter. Josh Uche, bad camp. Just, just flat out not good. And yet... This dude still tied for the team lead in sacks with four. Kyle Duggar also had four sacks, by the way, which could tell you how bad some of this pass protection was during camp, just flying through unblocked uh, on safety blitzes. But we know the talent's there. I don't really want to spend a whole lot more time talking about Josh Uche as this theoretical player who was great in 2022, and we just haven't seen him since. You hope it comes out. We didn't this summer. Who knows? But he makes the roster along with Keanu White, Deidre Twise, Anthony Jennings, O'Shane Zimenez, William Bradley King, Made a push here late. That dude's a former seventh round pick in 2021. Practice squad last year. I think they'd like to keep him around. The only way that I think he makes the roster is if they're convinced by virtue of his performance against the Eagles and joint practices uh, and then in the preseason that they can't bring him back and they're a little bit dinged up here. Maybe, just maybe, because Uche's missed time lately. You keep him and he could be a special teamer. And again, there's an open spot. We only have 52 players here. But I just he's he's right there in the outside looking in for me with Jaheim Bell. Interior defensive lineman. Again, this is the big neon all caps help wanted sign. 
at this spot. Devon Gotchow and Daniel Akawali uh, starting locks. Then he gets Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah Farms Jr. And I have Tristan Hill on the roster. Now, a couple things on this. Gotcho and Ekwali again locks. ekwali has been my surprise of camp. He looked good against the Eagles in the joint practice. He started every single uh, team period. This is good. Farms, big-bodied run stopper. You'll look at his pro football reference page, and it'll say 12 games played last year. And you're like, how the did he play a dozen games? And I just missed that. Well, he started the season on the practice squad and didn't get up to 100 defensive snaps played. So even if you are out there, Jeremiah Farms Sr., listening to the podcast, it's a big jump to go from less than 100 snaps played in one season to expect of that player at age 27 to suddenly contribute in a way that he's playing, you know, 30, 40% of the defensive snaps, even if right now he's DT3, as it were. Uh, now let's move on. Tristan Hill. Okay. A former second round pick of the Cowboys. He is listed at 6'2, 6'3, and 310 pounds. If Tristan is 310, I'm 175 and I run a four five flat. So it's just not it's just not the case. Tristan Hill, however, is more of a penetrator, more of an interior pass rusher. And we get flashes. Flashes are cool. And you can get by on flashes if you're the fourth defensive tackle, which is I have him here now. But when it comes to say farms get stinged up or gotcha or whoever it might be, they need a bigger body in there. That's not going to be Hill, but his skill set is valuable in a way. That that kept Daniel Ekowali around the last few years before he is now the plugged in starter. I think they still want another big body here. The one name you'll note, uh, or may or may not know, Armand Watts, who signed a one year deal after playing for the Steelers last year, a couple years with the Vikings before that. He's playing towards the end of these preseason games. And when I think back about whether it's a flash, this is an individual play or a series or practice, it's just not there for him. And it's, it's great that he can play. You know, you wouldn't want him on the nose, but he could play in a one technique, um, you know, four eye, maybe outside as a five. There's just not a lot beyond, eh, fine. Like, he, he's, again, more run first player. You've already got two in here. The upside, I think, is tapped out. Uh, if they're worried about losing him, maybe, again, he does squeeze into the 53, but there's nothing I can go and point to this summer and be like, oh, yeah, he's the guy. You're banking on his previous performance suddenly surfacing now in a way that has yet to in the new system with this defense because I, I don't think he's outperformed Tristan Hill, and that's why I had Tristan Hill ahead of him, even if they're slightly different players, especially from a pass rush standpoint. Okay, enough interior defensive line. Four more inside linebackers. This brings us to 38 players. Juwan Bentley, Jelani Tavai. Tavai's going to play a lot on the edge, by the way. So if you're worried about Anthony Jennings, Keanu White, like this is the most boring cocktail of edge rushers I've ever had. Well, Jelani Tavai is not going to spice it up necessarily, but – He's strong enough to play early downs and mix it up a little bit on third down. So he's there. I have Raquan McMillan and Christian Ellis in this roster, and we're going to go back to, you guessed it, uh, special teams. Not because it's a particularly sexy topic, but again, when you look at the players, the five or six the Patriots have right now, who are starting on kick return, kickoff, punt return, punt team, those two dudes are on all four. So... I like them not only as core special teamers, but Christian Ellis supposedly catching the eye of Dante Hightower. Big, physical, uh, trigger kind of player downhill against the run. He got washed out in Philly where they've needed linebackers for God knows how many years. Probably since the original Jeremiah uh, Trotter was out there. Now that they have his son as a whatever round rookie. But the point being is they make it because they contribute in two phases. No, they're not great. But eventually the Patriots will get Sione Takitaki back. At that point, I think you would see a McMillan or an Ellis off the roster. But for now, both of them stick. They're fine backup inside linebackers, but they are starters on three, if not all four, special teams units. And I think it's four, but um, sometimes these looks change. But they're, they're, I think they're going to make the team. Cornerback is uh, another six right here. The six is to 44 players. Christian Gonzalez, Jonathan Jones, Marcus Jones, Alex Austin, Marco Wilson, Isaiah Bolden. In my opinion... The only question mark here is Bolden. That's it. We're not going to talk about special teams with him. <laughs> but we can't talk about athletic traits. 6'2 player runs a sub 4'4. Four, four. This is effectively his rookie year. Remember, he's now missed. Uh, hasn't played in a game. Well, he has played in a preseason game, but gets knocked down in Green Bay. Scary as hell concussion. Doesn't come back. He's back now. We haven't seen a ton of playmaking as far as disruption, pass deflections, interceptions, even blitzing from him so far in camp. I just think those are the end of the roster players 
you bank on and develop a little bit more, especially coming from where he did at the FCS level to make an impact. I'm a little surprised also they haven't used him as a return man, but I already promised we're not going to talk special teams. Let's go to the top. Um, look, it's Christian Gonzalez. Jonathan Jones is still their best second option opposite him on the outside. Marcus Jones are really trying to make work in, at nickel. I haven't loved it so far. And even recently in the last couple of days, giving up three catches, working against the scout team offense, not a good sign but he's still working his way back after missing three weeks of practice. Alex Austin has been routinely outside corner number three. And Marco Wilson, for me, is up there as far as ball disruption, even if he's had a couple of bad, bad practices. The pedigree is there. The history of production in Arizona. I think you just trust it a little bit more, even if Alex Austin's probably been a smidge better. You're talking about your fourth or fifth corner. You, you take a guy who's been a starter in the league before, even if he's not that player that we saw in Arizona in 2022, if anyone was watching Arizona in 2022. Uh, but those are my six. The one name I left off here, well, I actually left off two. Sean Wade, who people forget made this roster. I'm talking about media members as well. Like last year, we're in the locker room, as we will be this week, after roster cuts. Hey, congrats, man. Well done, making the team. A lot of people dapped up Sean Wade last year in the locker room. That dude has made the roster outright several years now since he got traded from Baltimore. I think it was 2021 as a fifth round pick and the Ravens were like, yeah, we've seen enough. He is the cockroach. And I say this loving of the cornerbacks room. If there's a nuclear Holocaust, we we'll have Sean Wade is going to still be a healthy scratch that Sunday for the Patriots. For me though, I think this is the end of the road. They've got younger players, uh, more disruptive ones, better in man to man. And I think he's on the outside looking in, but here he is. I'll probably be dapping him up in a few days and saying, hey, congrats again, making the team. Second name I left out is Easy Hearn. He finished with the most pass breakups in camp out of anyone. Any position, competitive team period, 7 on 7s and 11 on 11s. And this is a dude who started fairly, I think, with the nickname Easy Burn. Not particularly clever, but it fit based on how he was performing, not just in those periods, but in one-on-ones. And there were stretches when he got abused. But he has really worked himself back, not only outside, but in the slot. This is a feisty dude. So here's hoping that he comes back or sticks elsewhere and builds because he's shown a persistence in a playmaking. Again, most pass deflections in camp, which is not everything, but it's the things that we can measure and are clean and you know measurable right in front of our faces. It's good for him. So I, I hope he sticks somewhere, if not here, and develops more. There's something there with this easy hern. It was on the practice squad last year, but... Uh, not enough to make the team right now. And what's I, I think an above average cornerbacks group across the league. Speaking of above average relative to the league, safety. We got four here. Takes us to 48. Kyle Duggar, Jabril Peppers, no notes. Jalen Hawkins, talking about him a while. He's looking good. Not only is a single high safety, I like him in man to man. Talk about pass breakups. He's near the top. And this is the undrafted rookie who I didn't think was making the team whatsoever this year. I didn't really like the class. Del Pettis is in for me, man. I've seen enough. And it's not just because even when I miss a practice on uh, Thursday or Friday, he has a pass breakup. He's running more with the twos, and he is in there for forced fumbles and laying the wood when he can. Now, he's only been on about two special teams units, which would tell me, hey, they're going to make a way. They're going to find a way to get him snaps because he's not going to play ahead of Duggar or Pepper or Hawkins for sure. But for right now, with Marte Mapu, who's been – just he's not been a ghost. That's not fair. He's been at practice every single day. He's just in street clothes, pool, taking mental reps. Um, not unlike Tristan Casas, but he's been there. Del Pettis is making plays, and at some point, you're not good enough if you're the Patriots. Be like, oh, this is a fun story, and thanks for coming out. We'd love to have you on the practice squad. For him to say yes, he goes, I know I can hang out. I can play. I've been doing it. And if you turn me down, I'll go elsewhere. I don't think they will. I think he makes this team. So there's your undrafted rookie. Uh, the streak of like. Was it 17, 18 years of Patriots added run? That's over. Uh, but maybe they, they start a new one with Del Pettis. Special teams. This takes us to 52. Uh, Joey Sly wins the kicker competition. He's 43 of 52, according to Alex Barth, Mike Reese, and others who have been keeping track of this. Again, I missed a practice late this week. Uh, Chad Ryland is not only 39 of 52, so that's four fewer makes. He's had fewer from 50 plus, and he has played far worse the last two weeks. Where, again, this is as someone who's watched every single rep, charted, looked, except for the two days I just mentioned. And the key is to weight the more recent practices more heavily. Not for the sake of recency bias, but to understand that this is how the coaches look at this. That's often the tiebreaker. Who's playing better as of late? 
because that's usually indicative of growth after three, four, four and a half weeks of practice, a bunch of preseason games. Right now, Joey Sly is probably a finished product, right? A journeyman. But he's kicking really well. He's kicking really, really well lately. And Chad Rowland has fallen off, including one practice where he was one of four and one more recently that he was three of five. So it's just, it's not only worse. It's like we can't have one of four or three of five or, you know, four of nine in that case over a two game, three game stretch. It's just, we can't have it. We're losing games. He did last year and we all saw it. Uh, the other two, Joe Cardona's long snapper, Brandon Schooler, Brendan Schooler, forgive me, his new Matthew Slater Memorial core special team roster spot. Though I will say this, you know, you'd think four safeties for a team that likes to play with three as its base personnel, its base three safety nickel is a little bit light, and you'd be right. Schooler's been repping enough with the second team defense or did and can't that I think they're comfortable enough having him out there. And so he would be your safety five in this place. He continues the Matthew Slater tradition of having one spot reserved for a dude who's just going to dominate on special teams, and that's him. So that leaves, excuse me, Kendrick Bourne on PUP, Cole Strange on the physically unable to perform list, and Sony Takitaki still looking for run stuffing defensive tackle. They'll take help and offensive tackle. I just don't think it's going to come because every single team is looking for that kind of player at that position every single year. All right, that was it. Let's get to the mailbag. I love you guys. We, I don't I don't know how we could measure this, and certainly no one would care except for you probably listening right now. I have the widest range of folks in my mentions where this uh, person writes in is Ice Frog. I have a goblin friend who I go back and forth with in the mentions sometimes. Creatures of all kinds responding to me. I don't know what it is about the coverage or the podcast, but bottom line, thank you. It spices up a lot of uh, bots or people with their initials and then seven different digits. Anyway, from Ice Frog, morning, Andrew. With Tyquan Thornton showing improvement, lining up with the starter so far this year, what do you expect his snap percentage will be? And what do you think his ceiling is for catches and yards this season? Thank you, sir. Oh, no, thank you, Ice Frog. Um, it's a good question. I, I think the fair over-under for Tyquan Thornton, understanding he is going to have to, I think, start fast because you have Jalen Polk right behind him. Javon Baker, you would hope, you would think, figures it out soon thereafter. I would put the over-under at around 45%. Now, that's obviously way higher, um, or it's not way higher. I think it's in the neighborhood of what he's been lately. But the first two years, obviously, he got a chance to prove himself. Okay, He played more snaps than Kendrick Bourne did two years ago when Bourne was in the doghouse with Patricia and Belichick. As far as his ceiling for catches and yards, I think 500 is fair. I think catches would be probably 30, 35, because he is going to be the big play threat. Like This is going to be a guy that you know and you watch and we all see. Uh, average somewhere between 14 to 18 yards per catch if they're using him the right way. And I think they will. We've talked about this before. This is a downfield, deep, attacking pass offense, a lot of play-action shots. He's suited for that. And again, now that he's tracking the ball better, I think he's a better route runner. He's not a well-rounded receiver still. But if you can just do those specific things at an above-average level, that's incredibly valuable. I just think, given the surrounding competition um, and what this pass offense is going to look like, those numbers are probably... Um, about where he's going to top out. Epri, Mike Reese. I love Mike. I would say for another He's never been on the pod. He can't come on the pod per ESPN rules. But that guy, I will tell you, uh, is as nice, uh, hardworking, and I'll just say as sweet a man as you would expect on Twitter. He's a, a very good, dear friend. And I'd say part-time mentor to me. Anyway, Mike Reese. Projected Jalen Polk as a number three or number four option, a recent article for ESPN. In a receiver room void of high-end talent, should more be expected from a second round pick, being quote unquote tough and having quote unquote strong hands, Epri not coming across as a Jalen Polk fan means little if he can't separate. To that last point, Epri, you are correct. You have seen many a uh, tough receiver with quote unquote strong hands uh, come through New England. Here's the thing though I've described his game as mature, and that says he understands leverage, is a better route runner, knows how to set up certain routes, and also played big, not only at the catch point. But I think early in the routes to win on, okay, this is third and four. He's probably running a slant. This is going to be some sort of quick game route. And you run the slant, you win anyway. That's what Jalen Polk is. Now, I do think that it's fair of you to expect him to be, let's say, a top three receiver for the Patriots this year in catches, in yards, maybe even touchdown receptions, especially if uh, Tyquan Thornton gets banged up at some point this year 
or they're going to run more 12 personnel, which might even take Pop Douglas off the field. I would say that's a bad idea. But the point is, yes, right now, he's not an instant separator. He still put up insane numbers in college with this skill set, and I think he's going to continue to grow because unlike, I think it's fair to say, Javon Baker and things that I've heard and we've watched, he's on his details more than Baker is, and he's less of an athlete than Baker is. The guys that work like that tend to get the most out of whatever he has, and what he has is good enough. It's just a matter of how fast he gets to those numbers. Now, I don't know if he'll ever get to a 1,200-yard season in his career, but right now as a number two, I think the Patriots would be happy, especially as a rookie, with around 800. Uh, this year I would take the under on that because I think it's wise to take the under on a lot of Patriots players if you're projecting them on offense. I just I would say give Jalen Polk a little bit more time. Um, they're not rushing him in the same way they're not with Drake May. There are lower stakes with Polk for obvious reasons, but I think they're just going to make him earn it. But by week four or five, I would be shocked if he's not a full-time starter seeing 75% of the snaps or more. So one thing they don't tell you about this job is you get one question a lot. Hey, do you get tickets? Uh, no, I don't. I have one press pass. It's got my name on it. I am the only person I can let into Gillette Stadium on Sundays to watch the Patriots play. But if I was going to get you tickets, I know I would go to game time where you could find any NFL or college football game. And I've used this before myself. I told you to go to Red Sox games at Fenway. And right now, game time is better than ever because they've got a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets to see your favorite teams play even easier. It filters out all of the fluff, only incredible deals, all for you on great seats. So you don't have to waste time searching through thousands and thousands of tickets. Plus, I mentioned I go to Fenway. This is my favorite feature. I get to see the seat view before you buy. I don't need to toggle between one site, then buy the other, and then check if there are lowest prices at game time or elsewhere because they're at game time. They have a lowest price guaranteed in event cancellation protection, job loss protection, everything. And if you find a lower price elsewhere, they give you 110% of that refund. So go to game time now, download the app, create an account, and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Pat's tickets at home, Pat's tickets on the road, college football on Saturdays, whatever you want. Just download Game Time today. What time is it? Game Time. Want to know. All of the B reporters seem to agree Caden Wallace played well before seemingly being demoted. Do you have any analysis of why? I would hope so. I have a podcast. That's why you're listening. That's why I'm talking. Uh, I ask with the longer term in mind. It seems to me getting him on the field this year is the best thing long term for the team, even if there are bumps. Boom. I hear where you're coming from, pal. Here's the issue. Caden Wallace, if they play him, is probably at this point going to be at left tackle because the Chooks of Core 4 experiment at left tackle is basically over. Michael Wenu is now playing right tackle. And so you would then be asking, not just a third-round rookie, to play left tackle in the NFL across the Jets' defensive line, maybe the best in football, against Nick Bosa coming in in week four. Um, all the dudes they just got, Daniil Hunter went to Houston, uh, where they're going to see in week six. But to do that in a new position, really, really difficult. And I've said this here in the podcast before. You go down the list of rookie tackles the last 10, 15, whatever years. It's not pretty. Those guys need time to adjust to the athleticism, to the techniques, just to the level of competition they faced in college. And even Andrew Thomas, I've said this before, top 10 pick, looks like a complete freaking bust his first year plus with the Giants. Now one of the best tackles in football. But it took him three, four years to get there. That's not true for all tackles, but I would just say, as a third-round rookie, changing positions most likely, he needs a little bit more time. And you would say, well, go ahead, play him. You can also destroy a player if he's only winning, and this would, this sounds high, but it's incredibly low for an offensive tackle, let's say 80% of his reps in pass protection. Because that means on one in every five reps, he's giving up a hurry or a quarterback hit or even worse, a sack, which then brings the entire offense down. Because I think any drive, last day, look, I want to say like, 86% of drives, somewhere in that neighborhood, don't quote me exactly, of drives that have a sack do not end up in the score. So what you're then inviting is any drive that features five or more pass dropbacks, if Caden Wallace is in that neighborhood to allow a pressure or a hit or a sack, it just invites disaster all the way around you. And then the other 10 players who are going, hey, I'm actually winning or I'm doing enough. Can we just get somebody else in here? It's fair to say, develop him a little bit more in practice. Give him more time. Right now, this is the rare instance, I would say, between the two players, the tie is not going to go to the rookie for a team that's rebuilding because you just need to have someone who's not going to make as many mental mistakes. Rookies do that, as well as 
feeling like the need to adjust to the physical difference going from college to the NFL. It's just, a, it's just a lot on a rookie uh, right now for him. So that's, you can't sacrifice a team for one rookie, let alone a third rounder who is changing positions. Most likely Lawrence, speaking of offensive line, if Michael one stays a right tackle, the Patriots start using more power and duo concepts. Have a good weekend, Andrew. Thank you, Lawrence. I did uh, Lawrence getting in his scheme bag. So, I don't think Mike Onwenu is going to single-handedly decide whether the Patriots pivot from being what I believe they will be a more of a wide zone running team. The other thing to consider is not just, well, if our offensive linemen are bigger and they don't move as well, we should probably not be his own blocking team. Your uh, play-action pass game needs to marry and mimic your run game. So if you alter and pivot, as you suggest, or maybe you're just at least thinking about and entertaining, the Patriots going from wide zone to more power or counter or duo, whatever it might be, you then need to change up your menu for offensive uh, pass plays, your play action plays, so that they look like those runs. And that's a sea change for an offense that's going to really be rooted in those two areas, the run game and then the play action off of that. So I would say I understand where you're coming from. I think he's a better lineman for man schemes than zone, but he's the, the difference is not such that I would change the entire scheme based on that one player. So I think you just need him a right tackle because you need a right tackle. And then you can focus on the opposite position and however it works with the wide zone, maybe you do lean a little bit more into man, but it's not going to be a significant difference because again, that will affect not just the run game, but how much they can play and design their play action passing. Sobo wants to know after you've seen uh, what you've seen through training camp of the preseason, can you regrade the last two seasons drafts? Okay. So I like this because every once in a while, it, it does behoove us to look back and put on some grades. But in my opinion, you need at least three years to properly like, let the ink dry on a grade for a draft class. So just think if you asked this uh, a year ago, right? You want to go, okay, can you grade the 2021 draft class? Because a year ago, it would be 2023. That draft class, Mac Jones, Christian Barmore, Ronnie Perkins, Reminder Stevenson, and four day three picks who didn't make the roster. We didn't know what was going to happen with Mac Jones. Okay. And if you split the baby, you split the difference and said, well, it's probably like a B, B minus pick. Like he was really good as a rookie. It's probably still in there. We don't really know. Okay. Then you give that whole draft class probably the same grade. That B, B minus is a much bigger difference than what you would do now because you missed not only on the first round pick, but on a quarterback. So what this dra draft class is really looking like, and we're not going to relitigate the whole Mac thing. But Christian Barmore and Reiner Stevenson, two good starters, above average starters, who got re-signed. That's good. But the difference is such that we know so much more about Mac Jones now that changes how we view that draft class. We're even two years out. It was too early. I don't think we can fairly do that now. But because I'm a gracious host, Sobo, uh, I will give you that grade. And I think the 2022 draft class, excuse me, is looking pretty much as it did right after it was finished. Cole Strange feels like a rent, uh, reach. He got benched twice as a rookie, inconsistent last year, and then got hurt. It's not his fault, but he's not playing a premium position. Tyquan Thornton was projected to be a fourth or fifth round pick. He's performed like one. Marcus Jones has been solid. But then you go to day three, Jack Jones, who was lit up like a Christmas tree with character concerns on a scouting report, lives up to exactly that. Billy zappy has been whatever. You traded Pierre Strong and then nothing from the other four uh, day three pick. So I would give it a D plus. That's a D plus draft. You miss in the first round pick. You've likely missed in the second, but we hope for the best for Tyquan Thornton. And the obvious pitfalls, the players you took after that, Marcus Jones, solid, but little injury risk because he's five foot eight playing in the NFL. And then Jack Jones, who turns out to occasionally be a jackass, was exactly that. Uh, 2023, this is another big one where if Gonzo and Keon White hit, like I would say most of us believe, well, let's just give the optimist case. Like these are long term pillars of the defense moving forward. This is a B plus at worst. I gave it a B plus right away. Did a whole podcast last year saying this is why it's better than you think, yada, yada, yada. Not only those two, two starters, if that's where it's, it's trending right now, it's tracking that way, Pop Douglas and City Sal. That's four starters out of a draft class. You're usually happy with two or three. Uh, but to me, if they do make that year two leap, those two guys at the top, not only just your highest picks, but guys playing premium positions, that would go from a B plus to an A. But we got to see. We got to wait. Give it three years. 
Jay Quincy Jr., do we think the sensible plan moving forward is for Cole Strange uh, to transition to center? Guard looks increasingly backlogged with uh, Layden Robinson's ascension. Could he be the successor to David Andrews, who played a few games there in college, undersized, smart, moves well, etc.? Thoughts? I think it's a, a fine idea. Um, we're not going to talk about this a whole lot because I don't know how many people want to listen to a guy who's disappointed so far and might not play until December. But Jay Quincy Jr., I like where your long-term planning is at for the front office because you're right. He is undersized. Uh, you're right. David Andrews is going to come up and retire, if not after this season, but after next season. And so you'd like to have a player who athletically profiles, a player that you know, be able to replace him. So uh, I actually forgot that he played a couple of games in center. Hat tip to you, sir. I just don't think we're going to be able to answer this question, or the Patriots will, honestly, until maybe this time next year. Kurt. Kurt got a shout out earlier when I mentioned the, the beer, I think, in the intro. Uh, he wants to know any good beer recommendations for the Pats game against the Bengals on September 8th. It might be a tough watch and a quality beverage will be helpful. Kurt, I am always glad to talk beer. Maybe we'll add that as a new segment on this podcast. We're doing mail fan. We're doing four minute drills. Here's the thing though. This time of year, not only because football is finally approaching is one of my absolute favorites because Sam's Oktoberfest is back in a fridge near you. Now I'm a basic fall beer kind of guy. Sam's Oktoberfest is the best Sam's, in my opinion. I I would swim in that stuff. I will also have a lot of Shipyard Pumpkinhead, another super light, uh, basic October beer. If you are into IPAs, Kurt, I will still say you can never go wrong with a good Trillium or a Treehouse. Friends of the podcast down at Vitamin C, they are located in Weymouth and in Plymouth. Great choices all across the board. And I do not think it's too late in the year for an IPA, even if it's September 8th, or let's say even the end of September, because the world is still going to very much feel outside like it's a summertime it's gonna be hot a couple other ipas if you're i i don't like them bitter i like them a bit smoother so the one thing i always look for is a good citra hop so if you're like me whether it's vitamin c or trillium uh, i don't like treehouse uses a ton of citra but wherever you're looking look for the citra hop and uh two more things i'll say i had this a couple of years ago up in maine it's a beer called epiphany by foundation brewing they're outside of portland um it's they say it's not a New England IPA, it's a Maine IPA. It is outstanding. Again, Epiphany by Foundation Brewing. It's not particularly bitter. There's almost like a tiny, tiny bit of pine, which I'm sure is why it's a Maine IPA. Anyway, pick up Epiphany by Foundation, ending Trillium, Treehouse, Sam's Oktoberfest, Shipyard Pumpkin. And the last thing I'll say is this, because I haven't overloaded you with too many. Could you tell I was excited about the question? <laughs> uh, if you're just looking basic, smooth, drinkable this time of year, most any amber ale. Is going to be good. And I, I know a couple of years ago, I had a very, very good Amber from Cambridge Brewing Company, uh, which is closing at the end of this year in Kendall Square. So if you're nearby, I just gave you plenty of options. Kurt, please write back. Let me know what you settled on, uh, at least by the season opener. Three more. Bosdon. I think this is Bosdon's first, first mailback question. You always remember your first Bosdon, and here it is. Isn't the consistent shuffling of the offense line an issue given the lack of talent? Good coaching and consistency can help cover up for gaps in talent. We haven't seen that consistency be a priority with the coaching staff. It's a fair point. I would say there are two counters to this. Number one is training camp is the time for that experimentation. There's always shuffling. And part of the benefit of that is to find out a guy that we might have drafted to play guard, let's say Layden Robinson at right guard, can he play left guard? Because if he can do both, that saves us a roster spot. Or let's say someone like Mike Unwetta, who in 2020 was a six-round pick, had always played guard in college. Why don't we just play him at right tackle for a little bit? And the Patriots learned very, very quickly he could do that. But the only way they learned it is to experiment or, as you said, shuffle the offensive line. Number two, I would say, is they don't know. This is not only a new scheme, a new coaching staff. We talked about the strike system before, the Scott Peters, ex-offensive lineman for the league, coached as an assistant for four years, all under Bill Callahan, who owes the, the belt, the fictitious best offensive line coach in football belt since Scar retired. Um, he's installing a totally new set of techniques that they're following. So there's a lot of transition, a lot of time, and you need to see who can apply that the quickest, which means giving a lot of playing time to a lot of different players. I will say the Patriots made this harder on themselves when they did not outright sign or add or trade for a left tackle and instead said, well, the guy we signed for one year, four million bucks before free agency and Chuk's core for he might be able to do it. Hey, Kane Wallace, he started for four years at right tackle. He might be able to do it. He's a third round rookie. And neither have. So you're stuck again with Darian Lowe. 
who I, I pro again is does not deserve to be a slur of any kind <laughs> as far as or a uh, to be associated that way uh, with just being a bad offensive line. But the point is, I think they're trying to be more consistent. The reason they haven't yet is because a it's the time of year, and b they don't know what their best options are. So you keep trying different combinations, and they're going to settle moving forward. And hopefully, it means on one to a right tackle, Robinson right guard, David Andrews at center, City Sal left guard, and TVD at left because. That's at least what I've been saying. And even before me, Doug Kide has been pounding the table for that. Two more. Pat season ticket holder, 1969. Uh, this feels like it's coming straight from talk radio, but I, I get where you're coming from this. Isn't the top story that Bob Kraft has undermined his rookie head coach by not allowing him to have the budget to sign former Pat's offensive assistant Nick Cayley from the McVay tree, leaving AVP to shortchange Bay's development by running Jacoby's Browns offense? A lot going on here. Number one because I had tidbits of this at the time. I didn't wrap it up the way that I, I wanted to pursue it. Some stories you don't get both hands around. This was one of them. But in the tidbits I've heard since, I want to keep the door open to the possibility here where, yes, the Patriots did offense, offer their offensive coordinator job to Nick Cayley, who's the tight ends coach for the Rams. First of all, I would not put him under the McVay tree because the two of them worked together for all of nine, 10 months. Number two, if you're Nick Cayley, and you want to stay at home, where I know he has loved it in Los Angeles, but you don't want to disrespect someone where you still have good relationships, obviously back there in New England, you counter with an offer that might be absolutely exorbitant. Like an offer you know they're not going to take, and ultimately they'll turn you down. I'm not saying definitively that happened, but I think you would be surprised, as we all were, that a guy who uh, has never been an offensive coordinator, would have come home to run the show, been familiar with the staff and familiar with the players, said no to that opportunity, even though he interviewed and flew out. So that's just something to keep in mind. As far as shortchanging May's development, look, they can absolutely uh, walk and talk at the same time and shoot gun. And they're doing that. May should have had more reps with the starting offensive line earlier in camp. I think they were just too optimistic about their backup offensive line. I was not. But the Browns offense is a fine offense that they're more or less copying and pasting here. The drills underpinning it are drills that have been run since the late 70s that help mold Aaron Rodgers. Honestly, Joel Montana did some of the same footwork stuff. The timing, the concepts, everything that holds this together is good, proven offensive football. Obviously, it looks a lot better when you have players like they do in Cleveland, starting with a great offensive line, Nick Chubb, uh, Amari Cooper, David Njoku, more recently a tight end, to bring that to life. So the fact that it struggles is more to do with the talent, as it always is, in the coaching and the structure, only in most extreme examples of great schematics or horrible organization and execution is it mostly on the coaching. Alex Van Pelt, I think, is going to be fine. It's something that's going to blow you away, but we know the talent is already underwhelming us. So it's not Jacoby Brissett's fault. I don't think it's Alex Van Pelt's fault. I don't think it's Robert Kraft's fault. There are a lot of things here. It was an unattractive job. I know multiple candidates were underwhelmed about the process when they talked with the Patriots, and here we are. But I think the Patriots could have done a lot worse the guy who played quarterback has coached them for over 20 years and has been around a lot of different systems to pull what he likes from other spots. Uh, it doesn't mean he's going to succeed or thrive or even last more than two seasons, but honestly, give him more time to think about it. And I wasn't giving this a big resounding a plus move, even a B there might, there's probably a higher floor here with Alex Van Pelt, given the lack of talent in his background, than there would have been with Nick Cayley as a first year, first time offensive coordinator who's never coached quarterbacks, and now you have a number three overall pick that you're in charge of or handing it to somebody else in your coaching tree, your experience. Uh, yeah, you had the one year with McVay. But Zach Robinson took all those dudes to Atlanta, so it's not like he's pulling anyone to come back here and install that system. He probably would have gone back to old Patriots stuff. Okay, I went way too long there. Let's wrap with Carlos. Hey, Andrew, do you expect the new staff to continue the tradition? I think this means staff is like the front office. The tradition of guys catching the Foxborough flu right before cutdown day. So, hey, so-and-so is going to be out a month. Why don't we stash him on injured reserve? Are there any banged-up bottom of roster players that might catch it? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think so. I also think that was a classic Belichick loophole that they used all the time. Certain years, it's warranted. Like, who knew where Isaiah Bolden's brain was uh, in the days after that game against the Packers? And you're just like, look, you're a seventh-rounder. He'll be happy to hang out, stay, develop, take mental reps, study the playbook, whatever. That's what he did. I would say Marte Mapu here is a good one. Either 
as a season long candidate or someone, because this is new this year, and this is something to keep in mind for Tuesday, you can designate players to return from IR on cutdown day to then return within four weeks after that, just like during the regular season. You have a certain number of them. I think it's eight um, total players. Each team can designate to return from injured reserve. It might be six. And so the Patriots can do that on cutdown day. Marte Mapu is a candidate for that. The other injured guys are mostly on the PUP list. And everyone else, I think they're just kind of taking it easy. So the short answer is no. Mapu would be my best guess. Uh, but beyond that, you know, I think Hunter Henry is going to be back in a little bit. Everyone else who's been hurt. Um, Christian Barmore might be another good one. Um, but they've at least been around, which says to me they're not that far off if they're running, conditioning, near the drills, et cetera, et cetera. All right, this is probably history-making solo episode. I desperately need to have a tea or something to in my throat. We have an hour left till the Patriots kick off in the preseason. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. If you have a second, please rate and review. This helps me get better. This helps us grow as the show. We can do more fun things like talking to players. We will have another four-minute drill. We will have two more episodes. We will have a lot of fun and laughs coming up this week. And, of course, Roster Cuts, Tuesday at 4 p.m. Until then, here is your roster projection and mailbag question answers. Uh, We will see you soon. And we made it. Less than two weeks to the season over.